Good afternoon for those of you uh, watching us live today. My name is Michael Saffel. I work for the Bourne Awards. Uh, there's going to be some responsibility for those of you here today in person, so you can ask questions and make sure the folks who have to watch us on demand uh, get the advice I give you, because I have a feeling it's going to uh, go both ways here. Uh, I have been invited to talk about the Boren Award, which is a scholarship for both undergrad and graduate students. Uh, this program is sponsored by the Department of Defense. I myself work for the Institute of International Education. We are the folks that do the Fulbright, uh, the Gilman, uh, and other programs uh, in and outside of the federal government. Uh, the Boren Award is a product of the Department of Defense. We are similar to uh, other programs that are sponsored by the U.S. government. I mentioned Gilman, um, Fulbright, but there's also the Critical Language Scholarship. Uh, because we are taxpayer funded, we have certain eligibility uh, rules. One of them is that you have to be a U.S. citizen to apply to the Boren Award. Um, we are not able to take in uh, natural, we can't take in somebody who is a permanent resident um, if you have become a citizen, that's fine. Uh, if you plan to be a citizen by the deadline of the application, uh, that is fine as well. Um, but if you're not going to be a citizen until later, you, you may have to wait until next year. Uh, you also have to be interested in studying a language, a, a language in a place of the world, a part of the world where Boren goes to. Everything I saw on before we started recording, a lot of people threw out the languages and countries they're interested in. And so far, so good. Everything looks looks kosher for us. Uh, you have to maintain your student status uh, at your university as well. So for those of you who are freshmen, sophomore, juniors, this is probably not going to be an issue. Uh, for those of you in your first year of a master's program, or if you're in a PhD program, which could never end sometimes, uh, you're going to be fine. If you are graduating senior or you expect to graduate from your graduate program in uh, May of 2023, uh, then that is going to be an issue. You're going to want to find out um, what your options are. Can you postpone your graduation uh, if you are a graduating senior, but you're going to stay at UNC for the uh, graduate program? Perhaps you should be applying to the fellowship instead of the scholarship. So there are different things that can happen there. That's what your campus rep is for. Uh, I believe my campus reps are attending this session. Uh, they will jump in whenever I say something completely wrong. Uh, about the school, uh, and I hope they do. Uh, finally, you have to be, uh, you can't be a dual citizen, <laughs> sorry, of the country that you're applying for. So if you are like my sons, my sons are both Colombian American, uh, they are not eligible to apply to Colombia to visit that country on a Boren. Um, they could still get a Boren, but they just have to go somewhere else. So just something to think about um, if you happen to be uh, have dual citizenship. Now and then you will see a QR code on the top right of the screen. That will point you to an area of our website. Depending on what I'm talking about on the screen, that, that will take you to that part of the website. Um, I use a computer because I'm old. Uh, most of you use phones now to get around the internet. My website is definitely not aimed at, an, at a phone screen, so it is not easy to find your way around. If you use a phone, Use the QR code, it's much easier. Uh, if you have a hard time finding anything on our website, on your phone, get on a computer. <laughs> it's, it's made for that, it's an old, it's old, I'm old. Our technology is old. Um, now, I mentioned this already a couple of times, we're funded by the Department of Defense. And because of that, we have a certain angle to this award that other, um, other programs do not. We have what's called a national security interest. Uh, we want you, uh, for those of you interested in studying abroad, to come up with a reason why the country you want to go to is important to U.S. national security. The good news is we, there are a lot of ways you can manage this. Uh, we never put anywhere on our website a definition of what is national security. It's too broad. There are a lot of different ways you can um, make this argument, and a lot of it will depend on what you're studying, what your interests are. Uh, this slide is sometimes called stay in your lane. I don't expect a STEM student who's studying robotics to be suddenly an international relations major when they make their argument in the application. Stick to what you're studying, stick to what you know. The argument needs to be detailed and focused, 
You're not going to just start naming 14 reasons why Japan is important to U.S. national security. If you're a business major, stick to business. What is the economic impact Japan has and how is that important to U.S. national security? Uh, stick to a business argument. If you are in environmental studies, you stick to an environmental studies argument about why Japan is important to U.S. national security. Uh, or your traditional international relations major, you can do the, you know, Japan, we just saw them uh, shelter in place when North Korea fired a missile uh, into the ocean, which apparently didn't work very well. But the idea here is you could go that traditional route if that's what you're interested in, if that's what you're studying. There's no wrong way to do this other than being too vague. If you're too vague in that uh, national security argument, we call that the Wikipedia answer, um, it's not going to do you much good. So focus on, you know, on what on one issue that makes sense to what you're studying, that makes sense perhaps to what you want to do in the federal government after you graduate uh, and, and put that in that essay one where we talk about national security. I mentioned working for the federal government because this is not just a scholarship to help you study abroad. This is also a way to get your foot in the door in the federal government. We have what is called a uh, service agreement. If you accept the funding for Boren, we offer you the money, you take the money, you use it to go study abroad in Taiwan, uh, you will owe the federal government 12 months of service. This is not going to come as a shock to you because you write in great detail in your application about where it is you would like to work in the federal government. Uh, we have certain things where we'd like you to apply to. Uh, overall, most of our born alum who uh, go through this program end up working at State Department or Department of Defense but there are a lot of opportunities around the government that have to deal with national security where you could find yourself working. The key is you do the research, uh, you find a program that makes sense to your interest, to your skill set, uh, and then you talk about this long-term interest in working for federal government. You will have a 12-month service, no more, no less, for uh, you undergrads, for your graduate students. At worst, it's going to be a 15-month service agreement. But that shouldn't be considered a bad thing. You should be looking forward to working for the federal government. If you are not, this is not the program for you. Please apply to the CLS, apply to other things. Uh, but if you are not serious about working for the federal government, or at least open to the opportunity, definitely I don't need you to waste your time because the committee is not going to select you. The committee wants to see this person who writes at length about their interest in having, um, if not a career, a long-term uh, uh, employment with the, fed, with the federal government and also showing flexibility. So those of you who have one job in your brain, you're like, I want to be the ambassador of China, right? That's not going to happen for many reasons. But let's just say I want to be a lifelong diplomat. I want to be a foreign service officer, one of the most popular jobs born pick every year on the application. I want to be an FSO. Great. What does that involve? Do your research. Find out about the cones. The, 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 the cones are your basically career trajectories that you will pick from when you join the Foreign Service. Uh, there are, I believe, five of them. So if you don't even know what a cone is, this is when Google is your friend. Go find out what these programs, what these cones are. Talk about it in your application. Show the committee you've done the work. You've done the research. Also, be cognizant that a job like foreign service officer is difficult to get. It is not given away easily. It, a lot of people have to, you have to take a written exam, and then you have to take an oral exam. And even then, you may have to wait a couple of years before an opening comes up uh, and you're placed into the foreign service. So have other opportunities in mind in your application. While waiting to get into the foreign service, I would also be interested in working in A and B possibly also at state, maybe outside of state, USAID, something else. Uh, but you're showing the committee your long-term interest and you're showing your flexibility. This is all very important to your, uh, to your uh, success on this program. Finally, when do you have to start doing this? When do you have to start working for the federal government? If you're an undergrad who gets this award, you'll have three years after you graduate uh, to start working for the federal government. You don't have to be done. You don't have to finish 12 months in three years. You have three years after you graduate. If you're a graduate student who gets the Boren Fellowship, you'll have two years after you graduate to start working for the federal government. If you go on to, a, to get another degree, so let's say you're an undergrad, finish your Boren, 
your three years is about to start, but you say, hey, you know what? I really want to go get my master's or I want to go get my MBA. We will defer. We will hold on. Your three-year window won't start ticking until you finish whatever your degree is. Uh, so we will wait for you to get your uh, finish with your school and your education before that window starts. Uh, and again, you don't have to have it completed within that three or two year window. You just have to have started it. This 12 month service agreement isn't a isn't volunteer work, although you could do volunteer work. These, for the most part, are paid jobs. You're going out and looking for jobs in the federal government. We will be I have a whole slide about how we help you get your foot in the door. But ultimately, you're going to be looking for work paid work, GS7, GS9, GS12, uh, what have, whatever the case may be, this is paid work. We're not asking you to do work for free. Although some agencies in the government still have internships that don't pay, so watch out for that. Uh, now, those of you who were confused because you thought this was a language award and I haven't talked about language and I'm 15 minutes in. Uh, this is a language award. We are giving out funding to help you pay for an overseas program to study a language. Uh, language needs to be an important part of your application, even though we only ask you to write about it in about 250 words. So the idea here is if it's Japanese you're interested in, what are you doing currently to study Japanese? Is it possible to study Japanese at your school? You probably should be studying Japanese or at least thinking about studying Japanese in the spring. Uh, before you go on your born. If you can't do that, if you haven't been able to do that, that's an elephant that wanders into the committee's room, the selection committee. They're like, well, why aren't they taking Japanese now? I know UNC offers Japanese. Be careful of these elephants. We need to track them down and address these elephants in your application. Uh, what are you going to do in Japan? Did you find a program that's you know, strong in their Japanese? Is it 20 hours of Japanese if you combine your in-classroom work and your partner work? And Are you at a homestay? Do you have a Japanese roommate? All of these things you need to show the committee your interest and your commitment to language and culture. And finally, what are you going to do when you get back from born? When you go back to North Carolina, what are you going to do to continue your Japanese? If you have classes, great. You can say, well, I'm going to do uh, the intermediate to advanced Japanese when I get back. Fantastic. You, you, you're, you've done a before, a during, and an after. Not everyone's going to be taking a language that is offered at your school. So like, let's say Wolof. Do you have Wolof classes at UNC? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, if not, and whatever the language is, if not, you can say, well, I don't. we don't currently have an option to study. That's why I'm applying to the board. Uh, this would be my opportunity to study the language. Currently, I'm trying my best to learn it online, on my phone, on Duolingo. I've joined the Africa Club. I, you know, I've joined a Wolof or Senegalese Sene club, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're doing things right now to help get you uh, ready. Then you talk about the program you want to do overseas. And then you talk about when I get back, I hope to maintain contacts I make in Senegal to help so I can continue my Wolof when I get home. Right. So again, you're doing a before, a during, and an after, even if your school doesn't offer those classes. Most students only talk about during. <laughs> they forget the before and they forget the after. And again, it's understandable because we give you so little space to write about it. Take take the time. Put that sentence in there. Uh, you need to, as Ari said, talk about a find a program that has the most bang for your buck. Uh, realistic expectations basically it just means we have two words that we appreciate in this program: flexibility and feasibility. When it comes to feasibility and your language gains, if you have never studied uh Japanese before I don't expect you in six months to be fluent your expectations if at best should probably be I hope to have intermediate Japanese by the time I get home at the same time somebody who has advanced levels of a language uh may be able to say uh you know I have advanced Japanese I'm hoping after six months in Japan I will be at uh you know advanced high or even uh superior Japanese have a goal and have that goal be, um, you know, reasonable. Uh, finally, if you're thinking, well, the born is, high, you know, I'm asking born to send me to Senegal to study uh, French or Wolof. Um, do I need to find a government job that directly, you know, has French or Wolof as a uh, as a requirement? You do not have to. You can if that's something you want to do. 
Uh, but it doesn't have to be one for one. So if you're studying Arabic, you don't have to be a translator or a linguist in the federal government or for the FBI, for example. Um, that isn't something we've, we're asking you to do. I would like to see a connection between your Boren and, and it helping you get your foot in the door in the federal government. I, I think the committee would like to see how the Boren is going to help you in your federal government uh, you know, goals. Uh, but it doesn't have to be an exact direct line from language to the job. There are two types of programs that bore and fund, and I uh, I definitely have, I see Lance is interested in Wolof, so I'm going to definitely get to this. Uh, we have our flagship language initiatives. These are programs that Born runs, we pay for. Uh, they are what I call turnkey programs. You don't have to do a lot. You just tell us, you point to the program, you say, this is the one I'm interested in, this is why I'm interested in it. But you don't have to build a program because it's already built. Uh, you don't have to explain to us too, in too much detail what the program is because we it's our program. Uh, it is uh, different than a self-identified program, which for about 70%, 70, that's what most born are applying for. Self-identified programs doesn't necessarily mean you are finding them. Uh, on your own, it means you go to your study abroad office, you talk to your professors, you do your research, you tell us, self-identify, you said, this is the program I found at my school or online. I am explaining to you what the program is. I'm explaining to you how much it costs, and I'm hoping you give me funding to pay for said program. That's the majority of born funds. So they're slightly, they're, well, they're very different. Or, number one, we control it, we run it. Number two, you're telling us what you need money for. Now, the fleas, which is roughly 30% of our awards, they are available to all levels, undergrad and graduate. You can apply as a, under, as a scholar or fellow to the, the fleas. I will say most fellows don't apply to this. It's a very structured program. It doesn't give you any room for additional research time or internship time or things like that. So a lot of fellows stay away. That may be fine. Uh, if you are only interested in language acquisition, though, as a graduate or undergraduate, these programs are fantastic for that. Um, they are 60 hours, six zero on average language per week. Uh, this is an amazing amount of language in a program where the average undergrad is applying for about 20 hours a week. The average graduate student is applying for 25 to 30 hours a week. So it's more than double uh, most self-identified programs. It is very language intense. Um, they are fully funded in the sense that we pay for all of the, the program expenses. There will be individual expenses that we can't cover, but for the most part, it's fully funded. Uh, these are small classroom studies situations. Uh, we don't get a lot of applications for these. The whole reason behind the uh, initiative is to get more people applying to these languages. I started working for Born in 2005, a long time ago. Uh, I could It was like pulling teeth trying to get people to apply to some of these countries. The initiatives has money for these countries. It is basically saying there is an interest in the federal government that you go to this country and learn this language. If you apply to the initiative, you have a better opportunity of getting the award. It's that easy. It's that simple. It's not easy, but it's that simple. Uh, this program has a domestic component and an overseas program. Uh, the domestic component is at one of two universities. The first program we do is called AFLI. It's our oldest program, has been around since 2010. Uh, this program has eight weeks at University of Florida, no matter which language you choose. You will be at uh, UF for eight weeks, summer 2023, around June, you start. You would then fly overseas in the fall for one semester. Um, and that is what the flea is. That is what an athlete is. And that's what all our fleas are. One semester domestic, one semester overseas. You can extend. Some of you graduate students who do want to do research, but maybe are interested in this kind of language acquisition, you could apply for the FLEA and then extend for an extra month or two months or four months and do your research after the FLEA ends. Most FLEAs end around the end of November. Actually, we're coming up soon at the end of most of our FLEAs or the first, second week of December. That's when they most official, most of the official programs that you're required to do. You're required to do the summer program. If you get a FLEA, you're required to do a fall program. So I, that, there, that again, it's it's a little restrictive in that sense, but you do have a higher percentage of getting the award on average. So French and Swahili on the African program are our most popular um, languages. 
Uh, we get 90% of our applications for AFLI through just those two languages. We get very few applications for Tree, Wolof, and Zulu. Uh, we get them, but for example, I only had one Wolof fellow all of last year, uh, this past cycle. Um, it is rare. We don't have enough interest in, in these languages, a country, Wolof and Zulu, to actually have our own overseas program like we do for the French and Swahili program. We have a partnership with American councils in Senegal for French. Uh, I think it's called the West African Research Center. Um, we have our own partnership uh, in Tanzania with American councils as well. Um, because we have enough students every year who apply, we can maintain this. If you are interested in one of those bottom three or four languages uh, in Ghana, South Africa, or Senegal for Wolof, you have to find your own program uh, and explain. It's similar to a self-identified program. You're going to still do the Florida program, and then in your application, talk about the program you found in Ghana to study tree or, find, or the program you found in South Africa to study Zulu. Uh, and most people study Wolof at the same place. Everybody studies French in the West African Research Center. So that's why I said that twice. Uh, that is the flea. Roughly speaking, we get about a 35 to 38% success rate on this if you apply to a flea versus the overall success rate on the Boren scholarship is 26%. So it is a jump. Um, you trade some flexibility for a better chance of getting the award, uh, but, though, but not everybody is going to want to do that. Any of these languages I talk about in the fleas, you do not have to go through our Boren program. You can study Swahili, a country will offer Zulu on your own, similar to all of the ones I'm about to talk to as a self-identified program. This is just gives you a slightly better advantage of getting the award, in this case, a much better advantage for our Indonesian program. I know one person mentioned Indonesian. Um, but again, you're trading some flexibility. You're trading not being able to go overseas in the summer because you have to do this program in the summer. You know, there, there are certain trade-offs. If Lee, our Indonesian program is just for one language, Indonesian, Instead of Florida, we're sending you to Wisconsin. Again, this is something we pay for. We pay for your flight, your living expenses domestically, and for your overseas program. You'll go to Milan, Indonesia, recently in the news for uh, that soccer incident that happened. But this is a, although this picture makes it look like you're in the mountains, Milan is a very <laughs> modern city. Uh, this program, again, any level of language. The only language we need a background in, and I didn't mention this, was French. It was highlighted, it was on the slide. In, if you apply to French, and I see one person who wrote French, you have to have intermediate uh, high already to apply to the French program. You don't need a background in Wolof if you apply to the Wolof program, uh, or Indonesian, or, Tan or Swahili, or any of the other languages. French, <laughs> French is the only one we need a background in. If you apply to Indonesian, uh, to the IFLI, again, eight weeks, Wisconsin, then you head overseas to Indonesia for at least one semester. Uh, that program gets very few applications. The IFLI program generally gets about 10 to 15 applications a year. Um, if we had 10 solid applications, we would send 10 people to Indonesia. We had, and, and we don't always get that many solid applications, competitive applications. So it, it has a very high acceptance rate. Uh, the South Asian Flagship Language Initiative, two languages on this one, although in reality, we only get one or two um, Urdu applications for this. Most people are applying for Hindi, and somebody already mentioned Hindi on the on the chat, and that's fantastic. This program, again, Wisconsin, eight weeks, and then the program that runs this one is called AIIS. Uh, it's very popular for um, foreign travelers to study Hindi and other Indian languages. It is a, um, a very well-established program. Uh, it is for the fall. And again, if you wanted to, you could stay longer. Uh, the Hindi program is in, uh, in um, I always mispronounce this. I pronounced it Jaipur for years. And then somebody said I was pronouncing it wrong. So apologies. I don't remember the right pronunciation. All I knew was the way I say it is not. Um, something that you could do. Again, you could apply to these languages outside of Afli, or if Safli in that case, if you were interested. Finally, our most recent uh, addition to the fleas, Turfli. Turkish is not a language we used to have trouble getting people to apply to, and then we stopped going to Turkey because of uh, Erdogan. Now, the U.S. federal government uh, in certain areas are starting to go back to Turkey. Turkey, you know, the Turkey has, we have uh, mixed feelings about Turkey. Um, CLS, Critical Language Scholarship, which is not a DOD program, that's a DOS program, Department of State. Uh, they are backed in Turkey. We are looking at Turkey, you know, 
fondly as possibly going back in 2023, but right now we're heading to Azerbaijan to study Turkish. If you are applying to Turkey, Azerbaijan is the country you need to talk about in your application. There is a small chance we move it to Turkey. Uh, that has not been decided yet. But the idea is whatever you go, it will be Wisconsin for eight weeks studying Turkish, whichever level you happen to be at. Uh, and then you will either go to Az Azerbaijan. Let's just assume it's Azerbaijan right now, but there's a small chance I have to say it uh, because it hasn't. the contract hasn't been signed yet. We may end up being back in Ankara. We don't know yet. Uh, if that's a big deal because you have Turkish citizenship, <laughs> let me know. Uh, now, those were our fleas. Only 30% of our awardees apply for the fleas. The vast majority of people are applying to our self-identified programs. That's where you're going as an undergrad for the most of you going to study abroad, saying, hey, I'm interested in Japanese, like this guy on the first picture, I think, or is that Chinese? That could be Japanese, I can't tell. Uh, you would then apply, you would say, okay, I need a program in Japan. I need a program that is intense in language. And this is the program I'm gonna tell Born about and ask for funding for. If your school has a program, great. If not, go online, try to find other ways of getting these programs. If your school has only one program in a country and you're concerned, because you heard me say most undergrads are applying for 20 hour a week programs, and this program only seems to have nine, in your application, you can supplement your uh, program with tutoring or other things um, that would increase the number of hours per week you're studying the language. So don't give up on a program just because it seems too low, you may have an opportunity to add to that. Uh, also, you may uh, only find short programs that study abroad. Um, Boren requires you to be overseas for at least 12 weeks, unless you're in a STEM major. Um, you may only find five-week programs. You can stack those together. One five-week program, then start another five-week program, and then start another five-week program. And now we're at 15 weeks and you're kosher, right? That is something that is very common uh, sometimes those programs have gaps in the middle. If there is a significant gap of more than a week, you're going to want to tell the committee during the gap between these two programs, I plan to get tutors and, and do cultural outings, you know, basically show that you're still doing some boring ish work in between your breaks. Graduate students, you rarely do study abroad programs. You guys normally build your own programs like a Build-A-Bear. You are going in. Finding the language program is required. Everything else is optional. I don't need graduate students to force feed us a research component or an internship if that's not what you want to do. Language is the only important thing. We're not Fulbright. Uh, we get a lot of graduate research that seems to be tacked on because they think that makes them a better born applicant. In reality, the born is more concerned about the researcher than the research. But we're here for you if you want to do research. Just make sure that research isn't uh, going to overwhelm your time. For example, uh, you want to go to Jordan and study Arabic. Great. And you talk about studying Arabic, but you spend a lot of time talking about your research. You have a whole essay devoted to your research if you do a research component as a graduate student. In that essay, you talk about doing this research, and the committee is going to look at this and go, okay, when are you going to study language if you're doing all this research? How is that part of your program, right? You want to make sure that you don't, <laughs> you don't oversell your research to the point where they're like, this guy is obviously a Fulbright applicant who is trying to get money from Boren. If you are already at a level of a language where the research you're doing or the internship you're doing is in the language, good news, that counts as language learning in our book. So if you already have intermediate to high levels of Portuguese, you go to Brazil and you're going to work on your research or an internship in Portuguese, add that to the hours of a week that you're uh, studying the language, because we consider that language study. You should also probably have tutors and upper level classes as well, kind of put everything together in a stew there. Uh, but that's how, generally speaking, why we get so many um, born fellows who have 25 hours or more a week in language versus the undergrads that are usually between 15 and 20. Any questions? I, I threw a lot at you, and I'm about to open my cola because I'm, I'm going to lose my voice. I swear it's a cola. I know it's Friday. Nothing? Nothing yet? You know, I just must be doing a great job, so I'm going to keep going.
I have a quick question. Ah, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is very specific to studying Hindi, but the AISS program separately has programs that they offer, like disconnected from born, but they just have programs. So for example, if I were to do the Staffly and then um, was interested in like, instead of just doing the Staffly, like building my own program and like doing the AISS studies, but having the born funding and then the opportunities to study after, is that something that could be made into its own program or would you just be looking for me to apply to the Safley directly? So we have two way, three ways you could do this. The You apply to Safley, you're guaranteeing that you, you are committing to that summer program in Wisconsin and you're committing to whatever it is you do in AIIS. Now, they, they will put you in a class level where you need to be. So if you already have Hindi under your belt or Urdu, they're going to put you in a level that's appropriate. After that, you could extend, stay at the same place uh, or go to Delhi, go to some other part of India that maybe AI, I, I, I always say AI, I know it's A-double-I-S, uh, which, whichever. Um, you could go somewhere else after your official ending. So in mid November, late November, early December, then go do a, an additional thing with AIIS. And that's great. Or scratch Safley, go do an AIIS program in the summer. I just kind of betrayed where I'm from. Go from uh, the summer program through fall, never do Safley. So you're applying as a self-identified person uh, but you're still doing basically the same thing a Safley person do without that domestic component. Although, actually, there's four. If you're a graduate student, you could apply to the, uh, and I'll put this in, I have to move up one level. You could apply as a graduate student for independent domestic study, which is only offered to graduate students. Undergrads can do the fleas, which have a domestic component, but only graduate students can do something entirely different domestically. Uh, let's say, and it could be something at Wisconsin. Now we're getting weird here, but it's, I mean, it seems like then why would you even do this? You would just apply to a staff lead. But let's say, say you wanted to do this. Uh, you could apply for funding either at your own school in, in new, in, um, in North, I almost said North Dakota, North Carolina, uh, or you could do something in Vermont. You could go to, uh, if money is no option, you could go to, uh, Middlebury, uh, through all the money, all 12000 plus some, because it's going to cost you more than that in a Middlebury program, uh, and say, okay, I'm going to do the Middlebury program, and then in the fall, head overseas and do my own thing uh, in India or wherever, right? A lot of ways to peel this potato. Uh, so you're yeah. not required to do, because it's Hindi and it's AIIS, that doesn't mean you have to do this aptly. That's what, okay. that, was, that was a short answer to your question. I decided to take five minutes. No, thank you. This really helps. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so to wake up for those of you not interested in Hindi. Um, all right. So budget. This is what we uh, give out. Um, this is not, you know, so okay, how do we read this? So as an undergrad, the scholar, the green section, and the fellowship, the grad students in the blue section, the overseas is basically the same. If you only go overseas, you can only get up to only only get twenty five thousand dollars to help you pay for your studies. That's the cap. You have to be overseas at least twenty five weeks, and in fact, that is our preference. Unless you are an undergrad STEM student, our preference, meaning what we want to see in your application, meaning what you will not lose points for is if you are applying for six months or longer, 25 weeks or longer. It's just one week shy of six months. If you hit that magical number, not only are, does the committee like you more, uh, that you are also then uh, open to get in the entire amount, $25,000 if you need it for that program, whether it's a six month program or a 12 month program, at that point you can go up to the 25,000 limit as an undergrad or a graduate student. Uh, if you can only do one semester, um, you are, if you're not in STEM, you are basically, at this point, you're now fighting current. You're not swimming swimming with the current. You're, fight, you're swimming against the current. And we are trying to our best to avoid this. But let's say there is you know, some circumstance that requires you to be home uh, and you can't be overseas for more than 24 weeks. You need to express that in your application, why that is. And your campus rep should reiterate that in their campus review. 
and basically say this student would love to be in Japan for 52 weeks, but because of the engineering program they're in or because of the whatever it is, uh, maybe they have some sort of sport scholarship or whatever it is that you are required to be home. You cannot be out of the country for more than um, 15 weeks or whatever the reason is. Put that in there. It's an elephant that has wandered into the room and we need to address it because the committee is just going to be like, well, why are they doing such a short program when all these other people applying are doing longer programs? You, you want to address that because if they like you for every other reason, they're going to want to give you the award, even if you're doing a shorter award. You need to give them a reason to do that, right? Human nature. If you're in STEM, we don't take points. The committee will, will not hurt you for having a shorter program. In fact, we have a summer-only program that's only eligible for undergraduate STEM students. Uh, a STEM student can do a 52-week program overseas if they have the time for it, but a lot of STEM folks don't. Uh, we offer an $8,000 STEM-only program. Uh, in the application process, you would only be applying in a, you would be in a committee of only STEM students applying for this summer long program. So you're not going to get blown out of the water of somebody applying for a 52 week program. Uh, you will be with like minded folks, uh, people who have similar situations where they can only stay for the summer. Now, if you're applying for a summer only program, you better have some language and in, uh, intense language for those two months. Uh, because the committee will be like, it's a short program, but they put in a lot of language. So you're basically trying not to go for the STEM-focused event that may take up most of your time. You could do a STEM-focused event, but there needs to be language. You have to have language in there, and you need to present your argument for why you chose this program, lead with the language, right? Don't make it sound like an afterthought. Uh, if you do an eight-week program or you do a 52-week program, all undergrads have a 12-month service agreement. It doesn't change. Now, if you are a graduate student and you do that domestic program I mentioned, let's say you do an entire summer at Middlebury. Let's say you do three months. I don't think there's such a thing, but let's just say there was a three-month Middlebury program. You apply for that June through end of August, and then you go overseas for the full 52 weeks. This slide makes it look like I can give you 37,000. In reality, I can only give you 30. It doesn't. It's just hard to write that out, so I have to say it out loud. I can only give you $30,000 total. So if you need all $12,000 for your domestic, I am limited now to 18 grand I can give you while you're overseas. So just put that mental calculation in your head when you do your budget. It may make it more sense for you to find a cheaper $5,000 program for the summer. Um, you don't need to go Cadillac with that Middlebury program. Um, so <laughs> use the five grand, and then you still have all 25,000 left over for your overseas uh, adventures. What do we cover? What does the uh, the budget cover? What is this twenty five thousand up to thirty thousand dollars cover? Um, we cover that round trip airfare ticket. Now it's going to be a little pricier than normal because you have to fly on an American carrier. Um, we will cover your tuition materials overseas, medical insurance, room and board. Local transportation means let's say you are staying in an apartment near campus, but you still have to take a bus or you have to take a train, you know, what have you. Uh, that is what we consider local transportation. Um, visa fees, you may have to pay $120 to get a visa. Depending on the country, you may need to renew that visa every 90 days. Uh, that may be another 120 times how many months, you know, three months you're in country. Do the research. If you think if the country is going to kick you out to renew your visa, if you have to go to Malaysia to renew your, you know, Singapore visa or go to Singapore to renew your Malaysia visa, whatever the reason is, um, that visa related travel can also be added to your budget. So if you need to take a, oh, sometimes it's within country. You're at University of Hokkaido in Japan, but for whatever reason, you need to get to Tokyo to do your visa. Boom, you can take the plane or take the Shinkansen to uh, Tokyo, put that on your visa related travel. We do not cover dependents. That's the biggest one. Um, if you have uh, children, if you have a spouse, it is not verboten. We, you can still take them, depending on the country and their rules. Warren doesn't have anything against this, but we do not cover them. <laughs> it's probably not necessary to even mention the fact that you have dependents in your application. Because why? We're not going, unless you think it's a distraction, which the committee surely would. <laughs> so I feel like why bother bringing it up if it's not uh, relevant to your application? 
Uh, duration of overseas study. So this, this is a chart from our 2021, 2022 brood, 2022, really this past winter, we had our application season. We had far fewer applications in 2022 than we normally do. I expect that number not to go up dramatically next year. So this is still a good year to apply as an applicant, bad year for outreach where I'm trying to get more people to apply. It makes me look bad, but in reality, how can I help this? 74% of undergrads are applying for that 25 weeks or longer. It's usually closer to 80. Um, last year, 84% of our graduate students applied for that 25 weeks. It's usually 92% on a normal year. So it's a little lower than normal, but you can still see most people are trying to get the full funding. We reiterate this many times, the longer you're overseas, the better chance you have of getting the award. You're making yourself more competitive by staying longer minus the STEM students who, who we don't give a hard time for that. Uh, now, this very detailed map. Um, this is my Microsoft Paint map of the world. We shaded out in gray the places you can't go on board. So those of you who are waiting to figure out how you could get to Ireland, I'm sorry that we are not going to be able to send you there. Now, the rest of the world, we can send boring. Depending on the country, we may or may not be able to do so. So the green and blue countries are preferred countries. We're hitting another preference here. Again, we're trying to swim with the current, not against the current. We're already at 25 weeks. We're doing well. We're swimming with the current. Now we're looking at the map, and you're looking at the country you're interested in. Every country you guys mentioned in chat so far is either green or blue. Actually, most of them were green. Uh, I didn't see Turkey. Now, both of those are preferred on the program, so you're doing fine there. Now, the issue is if it's blue, that means we weren't able to send people in 2021 slash winter 2022. There is a notable exception here that Ukraine is still green on this map. It's because in February, when people applied or last year, uh, this past year, Ukraine was still things were looking bad, but no one really thought they were going to be invaded. So we were letting people apply to Ukraine without any issue. Everybody who were, was selected for Boren we told the committee, do not worry that currently no one's going to Ukraine. Um, if they applied to Ukraine and everything else was great about their application, we said, go ahead and recommend them. We will just ask them if they want to go to Kazakhstan or if they want to basically give up their award. Most people went to Kazakhstan. Um, so just in your brain, if you were thinking Ukraine, no one said Ukraine. Um, don't go to Ukraine. Don't apply to Ukraine. Uh, the committee will definitely think something's wrong with you. If you apply to a blue country like Turkey, or uh, I'm trying to think of another one, or let's say Venezuela or Cuba, uh, you're going to have to have an alternative plan in your application. It's preferred, but we still require an alternative plan. If you apply to a country that has this, if you're applying for a language, Arabic, Mandarin, or Russian are three most popular languages, we're asking you to have a backup as well. So if you were to apply to Kazakhstan, which is green, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, uh, Latvia, uh, Estonia, these are the countries we would expect you to pick as an alternative. You wouldn't pick a blue country as your alternative program. If you were applying to China, Taiwan is more than likely going to be your alternate program. Uh, Taiwan, it could be China. You could also pick, if you just don't want to go to China, um, if you're an ROTC, we probably wouldn't let you go to China anyway pick Malaysia or Singapore as your backup. We have two people, even though Singapore is technically not a green country, it is a purple country, and I'll talk about that. Uh, right now, we have two born in, in Singapore, and that's mostly because we can't send people to China right now because of the COVID uh, restrictions. It's just not, we don't want a student to get either stuck in or stuck out of China. <laughs> and right now, the way China is, we're just kind of, we're going to let that, see how things are going in 2023. Still okay to apply to China, but you're going to have to have a background a backup because it is Mandarin. If you apply to Jordan, uh, if you apply to Oman, if you apply to Morocco, you're going to need a backup as well, even though the, those are all green countries. If it's a purple country, that means it's a non-preferred country. Now we're swimming against the current. Uh, that is going to make it a little difficult to get the award, but it's not impossible. I have, for example, Mongolia, my favorite country uh, that is in the purples. Mongolia is, although I may have to change this to Singapore because it's starting to become my favorite country. Mongolia is one of those countries that just looking at the map, it sits right in between Russia and China. This should be a country that is popular. 
that should be important to US national security. You can still make that argument in your application. Boren doesn't consider Mongolia important to national security, but this is why it should be. And then you lay out your reason. Uh, this is why I want to go to Mongolia. Going to Mongolia, learning Mongolian, which is also not a preference, uh, is going to make me a better applicant for this particular job in the government because that has direct relationship with Mongolia. That seems like a winning combination. And we've had people go to Mongolia in the past. It's been a while. 2013 was our last successful Mongolian application. Uh, but we have it is it can happen. I would stick to the green countries if at all possible. If you do have a purple country and you're curious about what the track record is for that country, uh, I'm happy to help you out with that. I, it is not state secret. I can say, okay, the last time somebody won in Mongolia was 2013. The last time somebody won for North Korea was never. Uh, it, both purple countries, right? It's going to vary. <clears throat> Any questions about countries? All right. So... Take a look at Latin America. I didn't see anybody who picked Latin America on the chat, which is probably good. Is anybody here interested in Latin America? Brazil, definitely green. Portuguese is a preferred language. I keep talking about preferred languages and I haven't shown you the slide because whatever microchip is in charge of my PowerPoint has decided that it didn't want to forward my slide. There it goes. Latin America, only Haitian Creole and Portuguese are preferred. And right now I can't send anybody to ha Haiti. Haiti is a little dangerous right now. And by little, I mean a lot. Uh, if you are interested in Portuguese, you have a clear, a clear choice. And so far, things are looking pretty good in Brazil. We've been able to send people to Brazil again uh, after COVID. This election didn't seem too violent. It looks like things are going well. Uh, Brazil is your top choice for Latin America. It's a preferred language, preferred country. You're swimming with the current. Some of you who may or may not be interested in Haitian Creole and we're thinking about it, it's tough because I can't go to Haiti right now. You can apply to Haiti, but you're going to need a backup because it's a blue country. Uh, Haiti, the only place I can think of off the top of my head to study Haitian Creole outside of Haiti is the DR, uh, Dominican Republic. So that is going to be a tough one because you need to find an a you need to find a country where that language is spoken at least in a town or a city. Um, anyway. If you were looking at Spanish, Spanish is not a preferred language. Uh, you would have to have uh, advanced levels of Spanish and you really have to convince a committee to give $25,000 to you to study a language that's already the number one spoken language after English, both in the US and within federal government. Uh, it's a tough sell. And we, we only had two Spanish awardees last year. Um, it is out of 300 awardees, it's not easy. Um, you could also apply for an indigenous language in Latin America, not preferred, but the committee seems to like those more. We have four indigenous speaking folks out right now from the 2022, 2021, 2022 born. I have two in, um, in uh, Paraguay. I have one in Peru studying Quechua, and I have one in Mexico studying Mayan. So it can happen. You don't have to have a background in those languages. You just have to convince the committee. Why is it important for us to know Mayan? What is part, what is the language and what is the region of Mexico? Why is this important to US national security? There could be a very good reason. There must be because I have somebody there now. Uh, but for the most part, head to Portuguese, get a third language under your belt. Uh, if you already know Spanish, the committee is going to say, hey, this guy or gal already knows Spanish. They're gonna pick up Portuguese a, a lot faster than somebody without it. So you're turning a neg positive negative into a, into a positive. All of these other languages outside of French uh, can be at any level of the language. You can, there's no such thing as being too good at a language to apply to this program. Uh, and other than French, there's no such thing as having too little of a language to apply to this program. So something to think about. Anybody have a language or country that didn't come up and they're curious about? Um, we... It's up there, but I am curious about it. I see Javanese. Do you know off the top of your head <laughs> when, like, how how common that is so it's indonesian right so the uh most folks going to indonesia are studying indonesian or bahasa indonesia uh javanese we get a an occasional application but it's definitely not um usual but that's not a, necessarily a bad thing if i'm on the uh, there's six asia committees on a normal year right uh 90 percent are applying for uh if not bigger it's korean you know J mandarin slash Korean Japanese. Those are like the three biggies. 
uh, people applying to Thai, to Malay, to, um, you know, Uyghur, that's a tough one, um, or, you know, Javanese tend to get more interest because they're like, hey, somebody who's not applying to Mandarin. <laughs> and, and, and if you have a strong application, part of what we look for is diversity in application. So they'll say, well, we, we could send 20 people to study Mandarin, or we could, you know, it's a toss up between these two folks, one to study Mandarin, do we want our 20th person to study Mandarin or our only person applying for Javanese? That could help you in the application process. Interesting, thank you. If you were interested in the summer only program, the red uh, undergrads, the red majors would count. Um, if you are in any of these majors or any sub major that would be underneath one of these majors, um, you would be considered preferred. I was a education slash uh, theater major when I started at University of Maryland. None of those are on this list, right? Um, I could still make a strong case uh, for working for the federal government and, in, and and an interest in international, you know, going overseas and learning the language, I should still have just as strong of a, a chance of getting the award. If I'm a dance major I'm applying for Boren, maybe I want to make the argument a little, I may want that sentence in my essay. It may seem strange that the dance major is interested in working in the federal government, but here is how we got there, right? Uh, that may be a good idea. Somebody asked a question just out of curiosity. Do you get many applicants for Bulgarian? Bulgarian, Kaksi. I had somebody from Bulgaria in my office, so I know very few Bulgarian uh, expressions. I know Dobro Utro, Dobro Pien, Kaksi. It's very similar to Russian. Anywho, Bulgarian, let's see, Alexander liked it. Uh, Bulgarian is definitely not popular, but it doesn't mean you can't apply for it. One of my favorite wrestlers is from Bul Bulgaria. Uh, former wrestler in Japan. Um, the same, it's the same thing I would say about uh, Javanese. It's it could be. I mean, everyone's reading Russian applications for that part of that committee. To have a Bulgarian one pop up could be a benefit. I just realized because I forgot that we were started in the half hour. We got we only have like three minutes. Uh, real quick. Application, we ask you to go into detail about what you want to do work, what you want to do in federal work. Um, we want you to talk about our preferences, which is Department of Defense, jobs in Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence community. Those are our preferences. When you actually start working for the federal government or looking for work in the federal government, when you return from Boren, we're going to send you job notices for all over the government. You may get something for the Department of Homeland Security. You may get something from uh, Department of Treasury. You never know. If it's coming through the NSEP service team, that's the government side of the position. I'm on the IIE side, the, in, the nonprofit side. The government side will start sending you emails as soon as you are registered with them after you get back from Boren. Uh, and any of those jobs will already be cleared to cover your service. Uh, they're not guaranteed. You still have to apply, but some of those jobs are only for Boren. So you will maybe only be against 12 other people applying for the job instead of 2,000 on USA jobs. Um, you have special hiring authorities. We have a job fair. That's what this picture is from. Uh, we have uh, something we bring you into DC for two days to look for work in the federal government or to at least explain what it's like to look for work in the federal government. We have uh, agencies show up and show their wares uh, for you. These are all the things we do to help get your foot in the door in the federal government. What you do in reality does not have to be exactly what you wrote about or anything like what you wrote about in your application. The application is just to show the committee you're serious about federal work. It is not a blood contract. You do not have to do exactly what you wrote in your application. Uh, there, no one's looking at your application when you're looking for work. Hey, you said you were going to be a foreign service officer, but now you're applying to FEMA. That doesn't matter. We're just hope we're happy to have you in the government. If you're a ROTC, if you are a um, veteran, a, a student veteran, um, know that you have a strong, you get a strong kick in this application, you get a strong bonus, uh, and you can see that veterans have a 49% acceptance rate on the BORN. Uh, definitely make sure you mention that in your application. We ask, but sometimes people miss that. Hit yes if you are a vet, um, and we'll double check with you later. As I mentioned, the priority agencies, this is where in your application, we'd like to see you apply, talk about in your application. Uh, understand that when you are looking for work, if you're a contractor for one of these, I'm technically a contractor for the federal government because I work for this DOD program. 
if I was a Boren, I would fulfill my service many years over um, working here because I do work directly with the DOD. That could be the same for a STEM student who applies for a job at like Rand Corporation or maybe, um, uh, you know, one of the uh, Boeing, um, Lockheed Martin, being on a federal con a government contract would count toward your service as well. You wouldn't write about that in your application. You write about jobs within the government, but it's good to know that you have options outside as a contractor as well as working for the federal government directly when you graduate. A lot of agencies have national security related positions. It's not just those top four. You may find yourself at CDC or NIH or Peace Corps. All of this counts toward your service. Uh, it's just that, whoa. It's just that this is something that we are, um, we are, uh, we want to make sure that you know you have a long, you have a wide variety of opportunities out there. But in your application, you really want to be more focused on those priority agencies. Uh, I'm not, I'm kind of out of time. I want to make sure I uh, give you guys some time for questions. Does anybody have any questions about the, the basic gist of the program? I have a little bit of information about the application itself. A couple of letters of recommendation, you need a transcript, you need your essays. We talked about the essays already a bit. Uh, Alexandra, what, what's your question? Yeah, I have a quick question. So I'm applying for Russian, and I think it may have said this on the application, but there was some sort of conference that's at the beginning of June. Ah, good could question. You, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And that's what I, I just jumped to that slide. The deadline for the, the graduate program is January 25th, 5 p.m. Eastern, Jan February 1st for you undergrads applying to the scholarship, 5 p.m. Eastern. You guys are on the Eastern, so I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, the reason why there we have a June 3rd is the earliest you can start a program. We have a mandatory uh, summer orientation. We call it the convocation. It's on June 1st and 2nd in Washington, D.C. We, fl we fly you or train you in um, for that. Uh, it is paid for by us, uh, but it is mandatory. There are safety um, sessions and we go over your background investigation that you will, you know, things to know about while you're overseas that you're going to need to remember when you have your background investigations, when you start looking for federal work. And that's a two-day event. And that's why we, we say June 3rd is the earliest you can start. Your program doesn't have to start on June 3rd. It's just that's the earliest it can start, uh, born funded anyway. Uh, and then between June 3rd and March 1st is when you can start a born. So you, if you want to start in the fall, you can start in the fall. Most born start summer or fall. Uh, very few, nine, less than 9% uh, apply for a program that starts after um, after the fall. So it, it, it can, you can do that, but that's it's not common. I want to make sure you know my email address. I'm going to type it in the chat window, but it's boren at iie.org. Um, there are a couple of us that read um, this inbox. I'm the one who mostly replies to it. So you can just say, hey, Michael, <laughs> and I'll answer you. Uh, ask your questions. If it's a question related to your campus and, and how credits transfer and all that, I'm definitely not the person to email. Uh, you're going to want to talk to your uh, campus rep. Um, do we have a, an on-campus deadline we should remind people of? We do. I'm glad you asked, Michael. So um, we do have a campus deadline of December 30th. Um, and what that does is essentially uh, a committee of staff and faculty uh, with expertise in, in various world regions and languages will, will review your applications and just offer feedback um, to you to just kind of fine tune what you have before the official boring deadline. With that comes our endorsements. So Michael, I'd be curious to know what that looks like from your perspective when uh, a campus committee endorses a student application, how central is that to the very application or is that something that's just fairly optional? So technically the student doesn't need a campus rep uh, at all because not every school has one. We get, we get a lot of students from around the country who don't even have a campus rep on, on, on staff. Uh, maybe they're at a community college or, some, or something like that. Uh, generally speaking, they come to us for advice. I think it's, well, we know for, for a fact that students who go through an on-campus process have a better success rate. Um, they have more opportunities to bounce ideas off of people. I don't, I mean, we don't get a ton of applications. We get about 800 applications for the undergraduate award on a good year. I'm expecting about 550 to 600 this year. 
Um, that is a guess. I, I don't know. We could we could do great. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but the idea is through your your program, through people, your SMEs, your subject matter experts, the people who are looking at the essays, giving the student a chance to edit it before they hit submit. Um, we can see it on any chart. We Anytime we do the survey, when we look at schools that do this process versus the uh, the applicants that come from schools that don't, the, the, the it's it's night and day how much more successful students are going through an, an internal system. You're, the campus rep review, not just are you getting the students a chance to double check and fix things, it's also you are telling the campus committee, uh, this is a student who's mature, hopefully, uh, this is a student who has uh, demonstrated a strong interest in federal work. You're basically reinforcing what the student is already saying. The only time a campus review could hurt re in reality, the where, not the only time, but the, the most common way is when the committee goes, the guess, guys, the campus rep made a better argument than the student did. We get that a lot. So you, you uh, that could happen. Um, but hopefully as a student preparing for this and listening to me, uh, you try not to make make sure that doesn't happen. Make sure you're making just as strong as argument as everybody who's trying to help you. That's the same thing with your letters of recommendation. Uh, everybody should be basically on the same page. Uh, your letters of recommendation should understand what Boren is. Uh, they should know what you want to do in the federal government. That way, when they write about, you know, you as a student or you as an employee, if you have like an advisor or somebody um, writing your letter, whatever it is, they understand the concept of what Boren is and your goals, your career goals post graduation. So they can refer to that possibly. And again, we are all on the same page trying to get you just to basically convince the committee that you are, you know, this is the award for you because you are interested and you are federal career bound. You know, this is this is not just something you're doing on a lark. Any other questions? Will. Okay, so about, um... Yes, I'm curious about when you, first of all, excuse any incoherence, I'm currently in your favorite country, Singapore, so it's about uh, 2 a.m. for me. The Merlion, uh, good for you. Yes, um, but I, so I'm curious about sort of extending to the spring semester what that process looks like. Um, so is and, that for it, for one of our fleas? For the, yeah, in, for okay. Fleas. So basically yeah. in the application, you say, I'm, I'm interested in doing the, the IFLE program. Um, I chose the program because of its extensive language and yada yada, the homestay opportunities and 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 the fact that you know this has a strong reputation. After the flea officially ends, I plan to continue on my education either in um, where did I say it was uh, Malang, um, but maybe stay in Malang or go somewhere else within the country. Go to <laughs> go to Bali. They're just going to think that's Indonesia. Oh, that's uh, that's too nice. You got to think of somewhere that would be good for that. The committee's not like, oh, yeah, you want to go to Bali to study, um, whatever it is. You want to come up with an idea that extends and it can be a month. It can be six months. Uh, it depends on how what your goals are, but make sure it's language focused. And it seems it, it should be at that point, you should be at intermediate high in your um, Indonesian, roughly intermediate, mid, intermediate, high. So what you do could be volunteer work. It could be an internship. It could be something like that. Supplement it with tutoring. Explain that the internship is in Indonesian. All of that is going to sound great to the committee. And you're showing more hours in a in country sh should can't hurt either. As long as it doesn't sound like you're just kicking rocks and having fun. Beautiful. Thanks. Megan, you're good. All right, guys, I'm going to stop recording just so you have this and it's going to take a couple of hours for this to process. <laughs>